absolutely thrilled to be here uh, today. And it was almost three years ago when the York Circle started that I had the honor of giving the, the kickoff, the lead presentation. And today is sort of going to be that presentation three years later. Meryl Streep finds it bizarre that the produce manager may be more important than for your children's health than the pediatrician. How many of you are planning to go out for dinner tonight? Well, I would suggest that the chef may be more important for your health than the doctor, so uh, you should pay attention to how you choose your chef. So today's presentation is going to get into the reasons behind this. So first of all, I'll, we'll talk about the big idea, what we're trying to accomplish here at York and our faculty, and, and really to deal with major challenges we have today. We've got to be able to sustain our health care system, and we have to keep more people healthier. And the leadership we're showing, I um, we'll hope you'll get a really good sense for that. So the second part is to show how we're leading the transformation. And then, as we're going through, think about what you can do. And I'm going to challenge you at the end of our uh, presentation, uh, what you can do basically to help the transformation. I'm going to start showing a brief video. Um, I showed this three years ago, and uh, I want you to see it here again. was a situation three years ago. Um, we haven't really made that much project, so if we keep tracking diabetes, and uh, this shows that uh, the WHO were estimating in Canada, if we go back to 1995, what our rates would be, and uh, in fact, um, we're overshooting that. In Ontario now, um, well, it's well over 10%. We've all over a million people with type 2 diabetes. 
In principle, this is entirely preventable. We're producing this. So our challenge is, how can we turn this around? How can we deproduce diabetes? Healthcare. Um, in Ontario now, we spend $44 billion for 13 million people. Uh, that's in our Ministry of Health. Our Ministry of Health promotion has about $800,000. So we're putting a huge amount of our dollars in Canada. And this has parallels around the world. The majority of our funding goes to fixing a problem once it has occurred. And very little of it's going upstream into prevention. And yet, if you look at the reasons why um, people are showing up in uh, clinics and family practice and hospitals, 75 to 80% of that is due to chronic diseases and injuries and conditions. And these are largely preventable. So where is the leadership to address that, to really put prevention in practice, keep people healthier longer, and take pressure off the demand so we can create a truly sustainable health care system? So, the lion's share is spending on treatment, and uh, only a little mouse is going into health promotion. <laughs> we need to change that. Um, we all have our personal stories, and um, I want to talk about my brother, Charlie. I only have one sibling. And um, in June of 2010, he was getting some problems swallowing. So in August, he went to see his family doctor. The doctor said, maybe we should get a CT scan here. And uh, the scan showed he had a massive tumor on his brain stem. In September 28th at Foothills Hospital, he went through a 10-hour operation. I was there before and after for the next few weeks. He got through the operation OK, very, very technically difficult. But then Charlie had to learn basically how to think again, how to sit up, how to take his first step. He was in the Foothills Hospital for seven months, almost to the day. They gave him incredible care. And this is sort of the party they threw when, uh, when he's being discharged. Some of the nurses were in tears. It said he'd been the best patient ever because he has this tremendous positive and a sense of humor. And even though he was struggling, uh, he kept being positive, kept looking forward. So if we'd lived in the United States, uh, my brother would be bankrupt, and um, I would have had my house totally remortgaged again to begin to pay for the costs. It would have been well over a million dollars. So I fundamentally thank the province of Alberta, the healthcare system, and all of us why it's so important that we maintain our commitment to basically a socialized medicine so that all Canadians can have access to care when you need it. And we're all going to need care at certain points in our lives. So this is actually the key of the problem. If you go back 20, 30 years ago, uh, when I was a child, uh, we never went to a restaurant, maybe once in a year. But now we're eating out. It's fast food. Uh, it's basically we're getting bigger and bigger, and we're not being active enough. So this is creating a uh, one-way direct to diabetes, which you don't want to get, believe me. Uh, OK, so the challenges are large, I submit, but not insurmountable. So what are we doing here at York? And what's the big idea? And it's really in five words, keeping you more people healthier longer. And my goal is to keep you out of hospitals as long as possible. And but when you do need to go to get care, I want you to get there early, and I want it to be effective and safe care, right? So. We're challenged and we're looking at trying to make York Region where we are the healthiest in Canada. And we can only do this by integrated solutions. Instead of having health care over here and health promotion over here, we need integrated approaches, which we'll talk about. And uh, we want to lead the change here in our faculty of health. And in fact, I think we are leading the change. So we're shifting the emphasis to first health, keeping you healthy. But when you do need care, then medicine, right? As opposed to putting all of, virtual, all of our funding into medicine, fixing problems that are largely preventable. Our faculty of health is quite distinctive. Um, we have over 10,000 students. We have four schools, really amazing programs. So I now invite you all to be honorary students in the faculty of health this morning. You should each pick which school you want to be uh, affiliated with. Psychology, creating healthier minds. Kinesiology, creating healthier bodies. 
um, health policy and management, creating healthier communities, and nursing uh, for patients, getting them up active quicker so we recover quicker at lower costs. So we want healthier patients, right? So each one of you choose which faculty you're now a member of. And I hope I get invited three years now or at some point to come back because if you invite me back, then I'm going to talk about the most innovative undergraduate degree that we're adding to complement our current amazing programs. So this is going to be a new program in global health. And the sort of innovations we're looking at is having up to half of the students be international students. So one of the attractions for a Canadian student is that your colleagues who you're going to be interacting with will be international. Secondly, we'll be building in opportunities to go for a semester or a whole year at our partner institutions around the world, and we'll have students coming here with us. And we're going to use um, blended models of learning, online learning, so we're going to start developing some courses. So we may be teaching a course here in Toronto on epidemiology and bridging that with um, students taking the same course at the University of Haifa in Israel. The students will go through the content of the course, but in addition, they'll put up on Facebook and YouTube um, who they are and what's going on, like what are the political issues going on now, say, in the Middle East. So we want to, through the course of the program, you can virtually travel around the world by taking courses where we bridge with partner institutions. So you're not only learning content, but you're going to be learning about the countries, you're going to be meeting and, and sort of colleagues and building this global network. So stay tuned. So, okay, how are we leading this transformation? And uh, it's really a three-pronged approach. We're educating leaders who make a difference. We're doing research that's game-changing from discovery right into action. And thirdly, we're engaging not just the usual suspects, but a much broader range of partners to deal with the complex challenges we have in the 20th century. Educating leaders, um, we have major programs focusing on the quality, in particular, first-year students. We call this health aid. And I would now like to invite you to uh, an undergraduate class. All right, so you guys are all now going to imagine you are our first year students in, in nursing 1900s. Hi, fellow classmates. My name is Sasha. And I'm Leah. And, and we're, we're from, from the, the Health Aid Network. Network. Here at the Health Aid Network, we believe that all of us can have a great university experience and be successful in all of our courses. As members of your student success team for this course, we meet with upper year nursing students twice a month to discuss ways in which we can all be successful in nursing 1900. So some upcoming dates you guys might want to keep on a calendar is we have on October 1st your lab reflection paper. In addition, on October 27th is your midterm. And the last day to drop the class without receiving a grade is November 7th. So with, <laughs> <laughs> so with all these dates coming up, it might seem a little bit overwhelming. So our upper year students have given us some advice. And what they said is to start early. But what do they mean exactly by starting early? They mean by setting small, realistic goals. So for example, let's take our lab reflection paper. What you want to do is after, each time after your clinical, you want to jot down some points. So instead of just leaving it all to the end and scrambling to get it done, you want to have a slow progression each day. So it's a nice piece of work. But of course, if you do get behind, because if you're having a hard time uh, keeping up with your clinicals, your social life, your work life, come join us at a time management workshop. This will be held on September 25th from 3 to 4 at the Bennett Center. This was highly recommended by our upper year students and will provide us with personalized approaches on managing our own time. And as much as it's important to stay on top of your classes, it's also important to not neglect your own health. So our upper year students have said it's really good to join the Running Relief. It starts October 1st. It's Monday, Wednesday, Friday from 5.30 to 7 at the Track and Field Center. And it's a great way to stay in shape and also have some fun. Also, as nursing students, we often care so much about our patients' health, we forgot about our own. So uh, a great way to avoid this is to join York University's Health and Wellness Club for Nurses. They run fun social and athletic activities on campus, as well as group discussions that are tailored specifically for nursing students. So come on out, meet some new friends, and let your body de-stress from all that's going on. 
And if you have any questions about today's announcement or any questions in general, feel free to contact us either Facebook, Moodle, or email. In addition, we're wearing our red shirts and we're sitting right at the front so you guys know where to talk to us. Feel free to ask any questions and thanks for your time. Now imagine that you're in Psych 1010 and you're all psychology students. Hello Psych 1010 students, my name is Alessandro. And I'm Cad and we are from the, the Health Day Network. Network. At the Health Day Network, we believe that each and every one of you can succeed both academically and socially during your experience here at York University. As members of your student success team, we meet with upper year psych students and we discuss ways in which we all can succeed in Psych 1010. As you guys know, we have our first midterm coming up on October 19th. So as advised by our upper year peers, it's very important that you guys keep on top of your readings and also to make sure that you're making notes in your own words so that you're understanding the material uh, better. So there are some concepts that are a little bit difficult to understand and that's why they've advised us to attend a peer tutoring session. And there's actually a session taking place in Calumet College on October 6th. So um, that's held by UPSA, which is the Undergraduate Psychology Students Association. And this session is free for all members, so we do suggest that you guys join. But Khadija, didn't our upper year peers also mention that we should get involved on campus? That's right, Alessandro. Actually, UPSA is hosting a career fair for undergraduate psychology students, and this is a great opportunity for you guys to learn about the various paths that you can take with your degree and also to network and meet new people. That's right. So myself and Khadija will actually go be going to this event, so it would be great if some of you can attend and we'll see you there. If you do have any questions about any of the events we mentioned or just questions in general, uh, you can find us on Moodle and Facebook, or you can even email us at our health aid email. Or, as you can tell by our very bright and wonderful t-shirts, we're not that hard to find. <laughs> so you can con you could talk to us before or after class or during break, um, and we can answer your questions there. Thank you very much for listening, and have a great day. Now, I noticed a number of you students taking copious notes. Um, <laughs> Remind you, stay cool. Um, today's um, lecture and that's going to be totally available on the website. So we'll give you the address at the end so that you can really sort of sit here and listen and participate. So that's an example of how we're transforming uh, how we teach. Uh, when I went to university, the professor would get up and just lecture, lecture, lecture. When I first started, I would get up with my PowerPoint slides and slides, slides, slides. I would just ram all kinds of data by you. Um, today, as you see, we teach in more interactive ways. We're making use of technologies. We've got courses that are totally online, so a student can basically participate when it fits in with their life, with their schedule, because most of our students, over half, are, are working and have very busy lives. And we're also um, doing courses we call blended, so that's where part of it's online and part of it's face-to-face. -face. And we find that that's usually the best approach for a lot of subject areas if we can mix those two approaches. So we're transforming some dramatic ways of, of how we teach. Also, we're transforming where we teach. And more and more now, um, yes, we're doing lecture theaters like this, but we're also getting our students off campus, over in the Jane Finch community, downtown, up in York region, and we call that experiential education. So we're sending students out in the real world, working on projects together, um, working in a variety of institutions where they can um, develop their contact network. So that's part of what we're doing in educating, transforming how we educate. Um, the other thing, uh, I make the bold claim that each year we're graduating from our faculty 2,000 agents of change. Last year was 1,996. I just rounded it off. <laughs> How are we going to transform health care and health promoting systems? Well, if you think about it, each year 2,000 graduates going out. Um, many of them will be going on into health careers in nursing or occupational therapy or medicine. Many will go into graduate school. Many will work in a variety of public private sector organizations. So you think of what our students can accomplish as agents of change. Each year, 2,000 last year, another 2,000. If we can keep these students connected with us. So I asked our student last year, I challenged them to come up with the attributes. What is an agent of change? And I wanted it to be authentic so the students themselves would come up with what the key elements were, not one that the dean kind of dictated off in some morning or afternoon. And they went away and went through this amazing process and, uh, of innovation and little skunk groups and came up with kind of three key areas. 
So one is knowing, which is critical, integrative, reflective thinking. The second is being, what are our core values, social responsibility, lifelong learning, respectfulness, the courage to confront difficult issues. And then the third is doing, putting it into action. It's, it's leadership, it's advocacy, it's being a positive role model. So I would now like to give you an opportunity to meet an agent of change, Julia Salson. So Julia, let me tell you, is um, she's finishing her undergraduate degree in health policy. It's a very rigorous program. Um, she's doing incredibly well, but there's huge academic demands just completing that program. But I wanted Julia to tell you that she does a few additional things. So uh, to begin with this year, um, as you guys see, the Agents of Change model, and Harvey was talking about graduating Agents of Change, but I kind of wanted to challenge that and um, kind of be an Agent of Change in my undergrad. I didn't want to wait until I graduated. So this year together with our colleagues from the um, Center for Aboriginal Student Services and the Aboriginal Student Asso Association at York, um, we're putting on our first annual student-run conference called UCAN, the York University Conference on Aboriginal Affairs Now, which we are going to be educating um, the York community as well as GTA communities on Aboriginal issues. I personally believe that Aboriginal issues are an extremely important um, aspect in healthcare, so we wanted to do that. Um, I'm also uh, finishing off a research grant from CIHR, the Canadian Institute of Health Research, on how information and communication technologies are being implemented and used on remote Aboriginal reserves. I'm also a student health ambassador at York. Um, <laughs> What else do I do? I work with um, the Director of Strategic Initiatives at the Student club, SAMPI. Oh, yes. So I'm a part of a student club, SAMPI, which is the Student Association of Health Management Policy and Informatics. I'm also working with the Director of Strategic Initiatives at the Faculty of Health on one of the academic innovation funds. I'm going on at York, and somewhere in there I sleep. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so that gives you a sense that for not just the academic work, but the broader sort of skills that are so important uh, I think is to deal with the challenges. Julie, you were one of the key students who I said a year ago, I mean, I used the concept of an agent of change and what does it mean? I wanted you to come up with uh, basically what we've produced today. So just give us a hint of what, how you did it. <laughs> So what we did, um, I thought we were pretty original, we created an event called Agents of Change. Um, what we did was we invited uh, faculty and staff from all four of the programs um, to have an informal conversation with um, undergraduate students on health. Um, we also partnered, partnered up with Health Aid, um, uh, sorry, and um, Stone College to create these attributes. So from a student's perspective, what does it mean to be an agent of change? And that's how we came up with this model on being, knowing, and doing. So um, as Harvey was mentioning, it's not something that the dean just made up off the top of his head. It really was an organic piece of work that came from the student level. And you came up with an oath. Oh, yeah, tell we me. came up with the oath, yeah. <laughs> so tell me about that. What does it mean to you? Basically, um, the oath, as you guys can see, it's pretty self-explanatory. What we want to do is when we go out into the field is transform the world. There's, we have a great system in Canada, but it's also um, can definitely be improved upon. And um, we just want to be one of some of the influencing factors in that. And what will we do at your graduation coming up soon? Oh, well, we're going to be chanting that oath. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. So in addition to educating the future leaders, which you could see here today, we're involved in uh, game-changing research. And it's from what we call discovery through to putting it into action, through to assessing the impact that it's having locally and globally. This is just a list of, of some of the key areas of interest to me personally is positive aging, especially as I get gray in my beard and for many of you. So how do you go about that and what are the issues? Um, Social determinants, um, it's really very simple. Wealth equals health, poverty equals illness. So how do we deal with poor communities and, and uh, work with them to increase their economic development, their viability, and to make healthier choices easier? We're doing a lot of work on the neuroscience, understanding how the brain works, shapes behavior. 
We look at the importance of the first minute, the first two years of life. If you want to age positively, the first one or two years of your life, very, very important in setting your trajectory. I mentioned earlier uh, most of the reasons why patients go into health care is for chronic diseases. They can be prevented, and that's a huge key um, element of our work. Disabilities, there's now over a billion people in the world are living with disabilities. The number is growing, and many of them don't have rights, don't have access to sort of services they need. Autism, um, the rates of that have been growing for some reasons that we don't totally understand, and uh, it really is a huge issue for the, the person, the child uh, living with autism, but also for the family, for the community. And finally, and in a moment, I'll give an example of what we're doing using a new technology for e-health. So we do work from the cellular and uh, a good example, um, Dave Hood is, leads our uh, Center for Muscle Health Research. In your body, 40% of your body is muscle. Uh, if you want to age positively, a key to that is being physically active. So as you're aging, how do you keep your muscles healthy? So Dave and his colleagues are looking at that from uh, the molecular level, understanding the physiology and, and what the impact of exercise or lack of it has on the actual muscles themselves, on the muscle mass and the strength. Um, we're looking at concussion. Um, concussions have been around for quite a while, but they've just recently been able to put a spotlight on and, and focus, and uh, we're doing some major research. And a lot of it's trying to look at how we can prevent it, in particular focusing on uh, children and youth in sports. Um, I mentioned earlier uh, autistic children, and we're using a really innovative approach where we involve the, the family, particularly the mother, and how they can play with the child and seeing a dramatic increase and then the child coming out of isolation and engaging with the world. Um, overeating, uh, if you look at the Canada Health Food Guide and even look at the amount of servings, um, and most of us um, um, underestimate when we're putting, for example, pasta on our plate, it's usually about six to eight servings. Uh, one serving of pasta actually is only about three bites, you know. So Jennifer Cook, and she's got recent uh, publicity in the CBC around the work of how to give us better information to understand uh, what we're eating and how much. We also then do a lot from the community, taking it from local to global, and just examples here. Um, Dennis Rayfield has been one of our international leaders showing how policy, policies, public policies, the impact it has on, on poverty and what we can do for poverty reduction, increasing the quality of life. A um, couple of our senior nursing colleagues, uh, Mary Fox, Deborah Trigano, um, are doing work with elderly people and the type of interventions in the community so we can keep them mentally active, physically active, reduce falls. Um, we're looking at a global um, system to monitor um, disability discrimination, so we're trying to really are world leaders in this, in, in Canada in particular at our university, Mercy Ryu. Um, <clears throat> Ellen Bielstock, she shows that if you're bilingual, if you learn more than one language as a child, well, first of all, the child then is much more able to multitask, uh, to do better during school, but the neat thing for us, like me, um, it staves off the onset of dementia on average of four and a half years. So when you think of the healthcare savings, because um, some of us, because of the genetics on that, we're going to have problems as we age. Um, I mean, our bodies get some wear and tear and mentally. So that's, to me, a really amazing look at the, uh, the economic impact of, of being bilingual, first at the start of life, but also allowing us to age positively. And finally, um, we're going to see in a moment um, how we can use um, e-health technology and particularly uh, the mobile phones to, to give access to health care and, and health promotion. So what if e-health could enable integrated solutions? Because this is kind of at the core. We can't have medical care here and prevention health promotion over here. How can we integrate it? So for example, if we're looking at a diabetic patient, most of the time, the care happens in the home, but so how can you link the clinical care with the home care using the technologies? While at the same time, we should be assessing the family. They're likely to be pre-diabetic, so can we have a family-based intervention to keep them from progressing to getting diabetes? And we need to intervene in the community to make healthier choices regarding physical activity and what you eat, nutritious food, to make that more effective. So that's an example of an integrated approach. Um, 
we're looking at developing a whole new profession, uh, the personalized uh, health coach could use this technology. And I'll describe in a moment, we're involved in a major game-changing research project. Why it's important, if we look in the United States, they, uh, they're veterans uh, administration hospitals. If you go back around 1990, they were absolutely abysmal. But they brought in new leadership, and they leapfrogged ahead of everyone else in the US bringing in the electronic health records. And uh, they've been able to do a lot of research on this. And they've shown that uh, using home telehealth, where you can basically call in and, and talk with a health professional, they've been able to reduce hospitalizations on average almost 20%. And that's huge, right? And for those who go to hospital, they've been able to reduce the length of stay on an average of 25%. So what it means, if you're at home and you've got symptoms and you're calling into the triage line, they'll help you decide whether you can just stay at home and how to manage it, or whether, no, you really need to get yourself into the hospital. And um, so this is one of the real advantages. And if we can uh, get this sort of savings, the cost offsets are really quite dramatic using these technologies. <coughs> yes? You can. Well, maybe I could answer that question at the end. So, no, Ontario, we're abysmal in e-health, right? With the scandals, and we, well, there are a lot of reasons for that, right? So, w in fact, I'm going to show an example of a game-changing project where we really want to be lead the change, and, and uh, it's really from the bottom up, right, how we're organizing to do that. But that's an excellent question. Well, key we're going to do is enable what we call people-centered health. So we want to give you more control and with the tools so you can take responsibility in managing your health, and then when you need care, managing your health care. So this is a major shift to give you the responsibility and the tools, and technologies can be very important here. Um, we're developing a whole new profession called the health coach. So this is someone who can, just like you can get a coach if you want to learn a particular sport, person who can help you more broadly in, in the health issues. And thirdly, um, information by itself, I mean, I'm a psychologist, information is rarely uh, enough to change behavior. We've gotten more and more information about the impact of smoking cigarettes, and yet still just under 20% of our population smokes in Canada. It's not lack of information about the harms, it's a whole bunch of other issues. So how do we get at the core, the key of behavioral change? And we've got some of the best researchers and training programs here at York University that we have in the world. Um, poor communities, they just have less opportunities for health. So with York's overall um, value of social responsibility and for our faculty uh, is why it's important for us to, to work not just downtown, let's say, in, in Rosedale, but really to focus here and Jane Finch. Um, and we've been working with the Black Creek Community Health Center and uh, my colleague Paul Ritfo has been leading a major project, initially looking at patients there with diabetes. And that's been the first of where we've done our initial trials of developing using the BlackBerry, where you can get access not only tracking what your physical measures are, but um, your activity and uh, health coaching activities. If we get it right, the slide before in the VA system showed that their telemedicine with diabetes, they got a 20% reduction in utilization. Persons who gets diagnosed with diabetes in the first year is going to add additional costs of over $5,000. Um, if we could get a 20% reduction, that's where the two little red stars are, then we could save over $1,000. Our estimate right now to provide health coaching, the software and access to the health coach, it costs in the order of $500. Over time, we can get that down. But you can see there initially, you'd be able to net $500, plus the quality of life improvements. So this is the target sort of research we're in the process of doing, but we want to show that we not only can change behavior and quality of life, but the impact it's having basically on, on saving funds that we can reinvest in other areas. Um, we're creating uh, not just with um, patients, we're doing a version of it here on campus called the Healthy Student Initiative. 
And we've got this really neat app, so if you're uh, we're walking up down York Lanes, you could go by like Tim Hortons, and it has GPS, so basically it basically pops out and shows you the menu for Tim Hortons and what the healthiest choices are. And this is the one for Mr. Sub, and you can see on the right, these are the three uh, healthiest choices, the albacore tuna, and shows the calories, the fat, the, and what we want to show is that we can influence point of purchase behavior using a simple technology. So I mentioned earlier that here at York, we're leading developing a, a new health profession called the health coach. And the health coach will have a range of skills and behavior change from health promotion through to prevention, through to helping care and rehabilitation. And secondly, um, we'll use the latest technologies so the health coach can be available to you at times face-to-face, -face, but in addition, essentially 24-7 through the technologies. So we want to then allow us to get into the poorer communities, into the remote communities, using the new technologies. Currently now, around the world, over 5 billion people have access through phones into mobile technology. So it's out there, it's networked. We need to provide the content and, and the ways in which we can use this amazing technology to, to make healthcare and, and health promotion readily available. I would now like to invite um, Noah Wayne to join me. So Noah is a graduate student in kinesiology, um, and again, he's excelling in his academic work, but he's doing a lot of amazing other things. Particular of notoriety, um, when we began our work on the health coach, um, Noah was the first student that we trained, so he is health coach number one. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us a bit about it. What is a health coach? <laughs> what is a health coach? Uh, Health coach is a new profession, as Dr. Skinner mentioned, um, giving uh, clients and patients the opportunity to communicate one-on-one -on -one with someone who truly is interested in their total well-being and not in the same amount of uh, attention that a physician or a nurse would provide, but more direct one-on-one -on -one for a more extended period of time, uh, encouraging behavior change, supporting uh, to overcome barriers, not just um, personal motivational barriers, but also environmental, um, economic barriers as well. Getting to know the person, um, and then when you're not face-to-face -face with the client, being able to support electronically. So with the history of our health coach program at Black Creek Community Health Center, we have the opportunity to not only engage with um, a clientele that definitely chooses and is grateful for the, the opportunity to have this service, but when they're not in the clinic, we're able to communicate electronically over the phone, through the uh, NextJ Health Coach system um, with a client, viewing what they're eating, seeing how their glucose levels change over time in relation to the exercise that they do, what they eat, and their mood. Um, so overall, very rewarding to be able to communicate at that level with clients. When we started, we just did a pilot study, I think 15, 20 patients, and then something else, an unintended consequence, something else remarkably happened over there. Describe. Uh, when we first went into the Black Creek Community Health Center to, um, to start recruiting patients that were type 2 diabetic into the pilot study, uh, on our tour of the new satellite that Black Creek Community Health Center has in the York Gate Mall at the corner of Jane and Finch, we were going on this community tour with actually a community member. And on the tour, the community member brought up the idea of, well, how are you going to exercise and teach exercise to the clientele that you're hoping to engage in healthier behaviors, and obviously exercise is a very key behavior to engage in, and currently there were no systems in place to teach exercise on the community based in the clinical level. And he said, well, why don't you just build an exercise room here? And the executive director and uh, my supervisor, Dr. Paul Ritvo, and myself said, that's a fantastic idea. And we did. We built an exercise room in the community health center at, right at the corner of Jane and Finch. Since its induction in um, February of 2010, we've had over a thousand community members from the Jane Finch uh, area sign up for the program, um, coming to the coming to the room, learning safe and effective, low cost exercise modality that they can do at home. It's also been an opportunity for kinesiology students in the School of Kinesiology and Health Science to share their knowledge and give back. Um, and we've had about 130 kinesiology students over the last two and a half years uh, volunteer their time three days a week um, over each semester, um, and again teach safe and effective exercise. And it's now been a, uh, 
a driving force for encouraging more kinesiology students to pursue higher credentials in personal training and exercise physiology. Um, and we're now working toward establishing this as more of a experiential education program where um, students actually get credit for this type of outreach into the community. So what's been the enthusiasm amongst the students in kinesiology? Um, it's fantastic. The feedback that we've received is that uh, direct feedback has been that there's no other program like that currently in our system to be able to allow students to actually gain real world experience engaging with clients and teaching them to exercise. And usually when we, the way that we've spread drastically has been from people who are currently volunteering with us to telling their friends and attracting more and more peers throughout the school uh, to, to, come and train, uh, to come and participate in the program. And actually we have our, our fall 2012 training tomorrow um, because of the seriousness, because of the high incidence and prevalence of chronic disease and the population that we exercise with, um, intensive training is obviously necessary for the volunteers who work with the population. And we have over 2,700 undergraduate students in kinesiology, so if you think of the, the people power we have in being able to have our students go out in a broader range of community settings, getting academic credit, but also doing a lot of good for the community. Thank you. You're welcome. The third way that we're leading change is, is engaging more diverse sectors, um, going beyond, as I said, the usual suspects. So we're developing major partners in the private sector and industry. Um, we're expanding more broadly in healthcare, health promotion. We're developing a much broader network of academics and a whole range of government and non-government organizations. And it's being able to pull together this diverse partnership that you have the team together that can really bring a novel or a new approach and, and make it work. Let me give an example. Um, in fact, three weeks ago in this very building, uh, we had uh, Minister Gary Goodyear here and made an announcement. We got the largest uh, research contract ever at York, $15.5 million, and the in-kind contribution of over $20 million. So it's about a $40 million project, and it's building what we call the Connected Health and Wellness platform or program. So basically through cloud computing, uh, you'll be able to get access to your comprehensive uh, electronic health record. Your healthcare team can get access to it um, using mobile technologies. But the really neat feature is that you'll be able to get access to it and including the health coaching. So not only can you look at what your health record and interact with the healthcare team, but you can have the health coach. So if you're dealing with a health concern, uh, that's how it can be happen. For students on campus, uh, it's health coaching, but trying to keep them. The issue we have on campus, well, two. One is we call the freshman 15. It's basically, on average, in North America, I mean, the kids are gaining about 15 pounds in the first year and, and are not being physically active. So how can we get them eating better, being active? Secondly, um, there's huge issues of stress, particularly first year. And um, so a lot of this is programs for stress management and, and health promotion. So this is a major project, and we couldn't have gotten this level of grant um, without, first of all, having our faculty of health, but developing a, a really an, an incredible range of partners. There were 16 of us all together in this consortium. It's the largest group that ever has gotten the major um, um, funding from the Federal Development Agency. On the industry side, uh, NextJ System, Bill Tatham and his group have been our primary um, industry partner, but through that we're networking out into RIM, Rogers, so we've got state-of-the-art sort of technology that we just couldn't get access here on campus. So we've got the latest technology and private sector that actually can build it rapidly. Academically, the two primary um, academic institutions are us at York, developing really the health coach, the behavioral change, and we're doing the overall management of, of the project. And the other is McMaster and Family Medicine. They've developed their own electronic health record called OSCAR, and they'll be developing basically a patient portal called My OSCAR, so you can get access to if your family doctor is on the Oscar system, you'll be able to get access to it. And you'll get access then to the health coach, all the things that we're producing here at York. Third, we have a range of healthcare institutions. Uh, the two, three key ones, we're continuing with uh, the Black Creek Community Health Center, just a kilometer from here over in Jane Finch. 
but we're doing a major program with the family health team at North York General Hospital. There, we're continuing to focus on patients with diabetes. In addition to that, at South Lake Hospital in Newmarket, we're doing a major project there. We're focusing on hypertension, so again, the cardiac management. And then over time, we'll, we'll get on into a broader range of health issues. So we're getting a key range of healthcare partners, and we go global. We're using open source um, technologies. We have a range of partners we can access to in, uh, in the US, well, indeed, around the world. So this is a type of partnership. York University by itself could never do this type of research if we didn't have our technology, uh, if we didn't have our health care. And uh, if we weren't able to find ways that we could actually all of us work together, um, it's, uh, we have a lot of fun some days. <laughs> York Region, um, we're situated, uh, if you go across Steeles, I mean, technically York University is in Toronto, but we're right at the top of, uh, of North Toronto. Our future, well, we have a lot of deep connections going downtown, but increasingly the future, York Region's the fastest growing in Canada. It's incredibly diverse. Uh, it's probably the most ethnically diverse kind of community in the world, and the diversity that comes from, from the, the, this culture, how it can support innovation. We're reaching out and, and developing a huge set of partnerships. Um, the project before I showed you is just one example, working within the school systems. There's a major partnership with the town of Newmarket um, as examples. So, um, it's a community, it's we call a living laboratory. It presents unparalleled opportunity for us to put our students out in experiential education to look at integrated learning, going together as teams. And we have unparalleled opportunities to do the, the sort of game-changing research that we're talking about with the cloud computing, but you're getting simple access using um, a mobile technology. So this is a strategic part of our future. Um, we're building a formal network. Uh, if we were downtown, it might be called a, you know, a teaching hospital network. Um, but our network is, is different. And we had a major meeting um, October 27th last year, Rethinking Health over at the Black Creek um, um, uh, Center. And we had over 130 people um, from different organizations throughout uh, the GTA York region. We had to cut it off. We could only have 130. And, we're building a very diverse network. We have the key hospitals there, like South Lake, like Mackenzie Health now in, in Richmond Hill and uh, Markham Stouffville. But in addition to that, uh, we had Daniel Zanotti, who heads York Region United Way. And I'd argue that United Way has more to do with keeping us healthy than the sense hospitals. Hospitals are there when we're not healthy, OK? So we need the diverse connection of organizations, for example, that we can get through United Way. And our vision over time is that we will be building uh, three or four key nodes. We'll have a research and learning center. And one of the first ones may well be through the partnership that's evolving rapidly with the town of Newmarket and South Lake. So it'll be located in that community to do ongoing uh, experience education and, and research. And we'll have a similar set of nodes throughout other parts within the York region. So, how could international partners help? Well, in this past year, we've made uh, major visits to India um, in developing uh, India's, one of those rapid growing economies. Um, India and China, 40% of, of the world's population. We need to have a strong presence there. So as part of our undergraduate global health program and part of our research, um, we're developing major partners with India. In the spring, we've been in the Middle East, um, particularly visiting major institutions work with in Israel, in, in the West Bank, Al Quds University, and in Jordan. And the uh, reason I have little bags under my eyes is uh, I just got in after midnight last night after being in Finland for a week and went there with uh, the mayor of Newmarket, basically it was an economic development academic mission with um, Tony Van Bryan, the, the mayor, with uh, Dave Williams and colleagues from South Lake Hospital, and, and Will Gage, my associate dean research, and I, and uh, a team of 12. Um, we found amazing receptivity and opportunity with a lot of their small biotech startup companies wanting to come and potentially relocate here in the York region. We were looking at developing a major academic partnership with the University of Helsinki and uh, the University at Tampere. So this is an example where we're reaching out around the world, developing very strong strategic partnerships so that we can deal with local health issues, but we can also be major contributors on the global scene. So, we're always searching for the magic bullet, how we can stay healthy as long as possible. I'm going to end with what you can do. First of all, um, 
be active, be physically active. So I do formal exercise, I get involved with spinning and, and yoga. Spinning, you're on bikes and loud music and you just spin away as fast as you can. <laughs> um, and I do yoga, but I also do other things. I always take the stairs. Um, I like to walk across campus having meetings. In fact, I have walking meetings. I'll, I'll get colleagues together and we'll go for an hour and we'll walk around campus. It changes the whole nature of the meeting. It makes it much more effective. So, what are the simple little things? It's doing a little a lot. If you take stairs all the time by the end of the week, um, you know, you've, you've got a few calories there you've burned off, and uh, it's a very mild sort of training effect. You've got to eat better, but you also have to eat less. Our notion of, you know, we can get to 2,000 calories really quick. Uh, if you just get a big hamburger with a bunch of stuff on it, um, uh, you get uh, pasta with uh, Alfredo sauce on, man, you're over 2,000. Um, you know, you've got your daily calorie input just from that one meal, so also eating less. And we need to keep learning new things, because as you get older, um, you just want to, that helps to build kind of your, your neural networks by learning. And you need to have a strong network of, of, of social supports, of friends and family, so join some new clubs. Also, I challenge you to be an agent of change uh, for your family and your personal health. And secondly, be an agent of change working with us here in York University, leading the transformation. <coughs> Why this is important, a um, major study published this past year here in Ontario, the Institute of Clinical and Evaluative Sciences, and they basically show that there's just five simple habits. If you <coughs> don't smoke, if you drink, do it in moderation. Um, you should eat healthy in the right portions. You should be physically active. And then finally, you've got to manage stress, right? The stress is in your life. And they show on average that uh, these factors contribute to increasing our life expectancy by seven years. But what's even more dramatic, if you compare someone who's following none of those with a really good person following all five, like you are, um, for men, if I'm doing zero, then my life expectancy is about 68. If I follow all five, then my life expectancy goes up to about 88, 89 years, I'm gain 20 years. Women, of course, are better. Um, your expectancy is about 72 if you follow zero. If you follow all five, it's 93 or so. So this is pretty potent, and this is data we have now here in Ontario. So to summarize, um, we're leading the transformation. Yeah, and you should a little check mark of what you're, and uh, Noah is, is available if you need some health coaching to, to work on those habits. So. We're looking at a solution that's not beginning in the, in the hospital emergency room or the doctor's office, but we're really in the community, working with the communities. That's where we need to be. We're together um, working with the diverse range of partnerships. We're not just generating new knowledge, but we're out there mobilizing it so you can use it. Uh, we're cultivating the next generation of agents of change, and they will go out and be major leaders in, in leading this transformation in health promotion and health care. And the impact is, is that we'll be transforming lives, communities, <coughs> systems, and the world. Why it's important, Tommy Douglas, who really is the leader, you know, starting in Saskatchewan and was premier in the 60s to, to bring about um, you know, the healthcare system, uh, universal access to a range of health services. And even back then, he understood something very profound, that we also have to focus on prevention. We not only need to provide access to hospitals and to drugs so that it's not catastrophic for the family, like it would have been for my brother if we'd lived, say, in the United States. But even from the get-go, Tommy Douglas knew the second pillar has to be prevention. And if we don't get more inroads in prevention, then the situation which we are at today, it's interesting, 30 years ago, he was uh, projecting forward that um, we may decide that we can't afford the healthcare system as we know it, and uh, we'll shift toward a model where only those that can afford to pay will get access to the full range of services. And the poorer communities and poorer individuals will be left out as what happens south of the border. And you know, we gotta fight tooth and nail to not let that happen. So I want to end with the future, and uh, the future example of Harvey's Angels. This is my granddaughter, Lena. She's four, just started uh, junior kindergarten, and Nate, year and a half. Um, I want them to have a really great life, a great world. But if we, do, we don't do something different, then their generation could end up having a lower life expectancy than you do. Right? 
because with the onset of, of childhood obesity. So it's ultimately for us in the room, it, it's about this future and creating a really bright future for, um, for our children, our grandchildren, locally and around the world. So I'd like to ask uh, the students come up and join me on, uh, on stage here. Well, it's not really stage, so come on up. And I want every one of you, we've now finished your, your program. As I mentioned, your honorary students in the Faculty of Health. Come on. So what happens when you're done your program is you get to go to convocation. So I would like each one of you, um, you can pretend you have your academic gowns on and your hats, and, and I, I want you to recite with us, um, this is the oath of an agent of change. So, we are agents of change for health, transforming lives, communities, systems, and the world. Thank you.